welcome back to Campus Party, everyone. Now I'll present to you Mr. Andy Wigley, a technological evangelist from Microsoft, talking about Windows 8 development. Please give him a warm welcome, everyone, and enjoy the presentation. Yeah, hi. Thanks very much for coming along. Um, as the gentleman says, I work as a technical evangelist at Microsoft. So my job is to work with developers to help them create great solutions using our, our technologies. I focus on Windows Phone 8. Um, you can contact me there. That's my blog, uh, my email, andy.wiggly. And uh, I'm on Twitter as Andy underscore Wiggly. Now, I'm here to talk about building apps for, give you an introduction to building apps for Windows Phone 8. Uh, but I want to talk about the, um, you know, the bigger picture, if you like, what, what you're getting when you, when you, if you decide to build apps for our platform. Because, you know, of course, we recognize that today's software development world is quite different from how, what it was 10 years ago or five years ago. In that time, you know, everybody was using our software and, uh, and we had a good big developer community, but the world's changed and we realize that. If you're buying a mobile device, a mobile computer today, quite likely that'll be running iOS and Android. But I want to convince you that uh, we are definitely much a very a big, a strong and third competitor in that, in that ecosystem. We've got a lot to offer. And don't just take our word for it, because this is what um, Joshua Topolsky said you know, last year. He said, who would have thought? It's like, you know, really, Microsoft? Who would have thought that Microsoft would be the company with the boldest phone and software design? And right from the start, we made a big bet when we launched Windows Phone 8 in 2010. We took a lot of, uh, we changed the, we looked at what the competitors were doing and indeed what we'd done ourselves, because let's not forget, uh, go back 10 years and we were the leader in, in handheld computers with pocket PCs and the like. But we looked at what was happening in terms of design and the, the whole sea of icons thing that's common on some of the other platforms. We wanted to move away from that and make something that was very much more people-centric and uh, very much uh, more fluid and a, a pleasant, pleasant platform to use. So the key part of that, of course, is our live tiles, which you see on the phone and the tablet there, which are our extensions of your app. They're not just icons to launch an app. They are actually a surface that you as an app developer can use to put information out to the user, information that matters to them. And this start screen becomes a, a very personal thing for the user. Everybody's start screen will be different because it has the apps pinned on it in the sizes and the configuration that they want. It's the stuff that's important to them. And this is, what, as a developer, this is one of the richest things we've got because you've got great ways of reaching out and communicating with your app developers, with your app users. And uh, we've got this common design platform which we developed with Windows Phone and of course last October last year, like 11 months ago, we launched Windows 8 which takes the same design language, the same user experience and extends it out to bigger format devices. To, to tablets and, and uh, touch PCs. And obviously, touch is very much a key part of our platform these days. And that ubiquity, that platform ubiquity, the, the thread that runs through our uh, phones, through our tablets, and through Xbox One and, uh, and elsewhere, this translates into a huge opportunity for app developers. So sure, I mean, if you're talking about numbers, uh, the latest uh, uh, market share figures just came out for Windows Phone uh, for, the, for the whole smartphone market and in the three months to the end of July 2012 in the five major European economies, so the UK, France, Italy, uh, Spain and Germany, Windows Phone has now got 8.2 percent. So that's, you know, we're talking now one in 11 smartphones that's getting sold is running out software. Now, you know, we're not, we're not getting arrogant or anything, we know that we're still a long way behind. And you know, in the US, iOS has like 46% and we have three and a half. So we've got a lot of work to do. But we're winning hearts and minds little by little. But the huge platform, the whole thing about building for phone and also extending that onto the tablet, um, IDC, research company, estimated that uh, Windows-powered devices will total 480 million. That's across the board, phones and tablets. Um, in the year, the year beginning last October up to the end of this coming year. So this is a huge opportunity. So this is a big marketplace for where your, your apps that you write can, can run and a huge potential marketplace. As far as Windows Phone is concerned, uh, we're making a really big, big push. Now, not mentioned on this slide, but of course a lot of you will have heard the news earlier this week that uh, subject to shareholder and uh, regulatory approval, Microsoft is buying 
the uh, hand, handset manufacturing arm and the design expertise and the, and the uh, service operation, the manufacturing of Nokia. This, that's a, as big a statement as you, can, you could like from Microsoft as being, we're deadly serious about changing our company into being one that's built around devices and services. As far as Windows Phone is concerned, there's been a huge, huge push, a lot of marketing dollars. So Windows Phone and Windows are being promoted together by us, and uh, we're spending a lot of money and a lot of great TV, um, TV ads. Uh, some of them are pretty amusing to, uh, to show that our platform uh, is different and is, is there for, for people. As developers, how you sell into this, we have our stores, our Windows Store, where, where consumers can purchase apps. And we've got 191 markets, which is actually a gr more global reach than any of our competitors. Um, and we've got great, uh, great ways of, for app users to discover apps. Uh, we've got really good um, sort of in-app purchase and uh, flexible ways that people can pay through uh, mobile operator billing, through PayPal, through uh, their own credit cards. And we support our, we've got our own advertising SDK and we support third-party SDKs. So it's a, it's a big, uh, big platform that really supports, we're going all out to support developers who are working on our platform. And on Windows Phone, we've got the, uh, the store app. This is a, this is a screenshot, an extended screenshot, if you like, of what our store app is. So we're always looking for new ways of making our apps, our, our application developers' apps, discoverable by end users. So in, in our store app on the phone, you've got the, the, the hero app, if you like, the featured one, uh, first on the main page, and then the different quick links to categories. Uh, and uh, we spotlight apps as well, and we feature app, apps created by our developer community. And of course, world-class software. We have really, really great tools. Uh, I'm going to be, obviously, I'm, I'm going to stop all this marketing stuff in a minute and actually get down and write some real code to show you how to actually build stuff. Uh, but we have got Visual Studio, we've got a really good emulator. Windows Phone emulator is actually a, a virtual machine, a Hyper-V virtual machine. That is running the full Windows Phone operating system. It is a complete phone running uh, in the tools. So you need to get this and we've got a whole set of tools in there. Uh, one of the big changes Windows Phone 8 that came out in November last year. So we had Windows Phone 7 before that, a couple of generations of that. And when we came to Windows Phone 8, the big changes were actually kind of under the cover. They weren't actually so visible. And there's a lot of consumer features, the visibility in there. But the real features are of more interest to the developer community. Because for the first time, Windows Phone moved over and now has a shared kernel. The, the core of the operating system is now the same on Windows Phone and on big windows. So this is a change. In the past, our, our Windows Phone was our, you could draw a line on a legacy of a different operating system called Windows CE, which was our operating system for handheld devices. Now we've got the same shared core. And this adds up to a lot, again, bringing our developer stories together. Uh, now, it's not, it's not as seamless as we like, and we're doing a lot of work to, uh, to make it even easier to create a, an app from a single code base for both platforms. But that shared core is there, and it's the firm foundations of all the developments, investments we're going to be making over the coming months and years to actually converge those developer stories and make it easier to create apps that run across all our platforms. So with a little planning, you can create leverage the same code base to create apps that, and that games that run for both Windows and Windows Phone. And it's not just at the operating system level as well. You know, the shared programming model, we've got a lot of commonality, both from the managed code, so C Sharp and VB, and our, our XAML, which is an XML language for creating the UI. And we've also got really great um, interoperability with uh, native, uh, nati native games development with DirectX. There we've got a very, very close story between Windows Phone and, uh, and Windows 8. So at a very fundamental level, Developers can leverage the same programming techniques using the same tools, creating apps for all these different platforms. It all adds up to a big, big opportunity. Right, let's have a look, closer look at Windows Phone 8. So I'm gonna, that was kind of a looking at the platform story. Let's drill down a little bit about Windows Phone 8. We've actually got three sets of APIs that you can develop against on Windows Phone 8. Uh, first of all, we've got a pure .NET story, which is um, it's compatible with our previous generation of Windows Phone, which is using XAML, an XML language, for the UI, and then C Sharp or VB as the programming language. You can also create games using a, a, a framework called XNA. This is a C Sharp or VB framework for, and very, very popular in universities. Some of you may have used it. Um, 
th that's a really great way of learning uh, games programming using XNA, uh, and that, that's supported on Windows Phone 8 as well. Now, when you look extend a little bit further to Windows Phone 8, we now extend that out to the Windows runtime. This API set in the middle, this is where we are 100% compatible. It's a compatible subset of what we got on Windows 8. So we're expanding out, and this is where a lot of the, the convergence is going on. And again, you can create apps with XAML. You can actually do the same thing and build in some 3D graphics stuff using some DirectX 3D. And we've got a really strong native code development story with C++ on Windows Phone 8. This is all brand new. It wasn't supported on Phone 7, so this is a whole new feature. Where you can create games using DirectX, Direct3D. And you can also mix and match a bit, so you can have a native library. So if you've got some native code, some C or C++ code libraries, and you want to reuse them on Windows Phone, you can do that. You can call that as well from your C Sharp and your VB apps. And, of course, we've got loads and loads of partners who, can also, who are also working with us to create great different options for you as developers to create apps uh, in the gaming. We've got Unity, Havoc, Marmalade and others. Um, and app, app frameworks, tools and libraries. Xamarin, really inter interesting partner who create, use C Sharp to create apps that, with, uh, that run across platform on, on, on our platforms and also on iOS and Android. And uh, Accelerator, and then uh, cloud-based services like uh, Push.io and uh, Flurry and, the, and Buddy and the like. And great tool, tool, work, uh, tool frameworks from the uh, partners such as Telerik and Infragistics and Censure. There are a lot of really great tools available for you as developers. Okay, I hope that's painted a picture of the landscape, if you like. So how now then would you get started building apps for Windows Phone? Well, the first and greatest news is that as students, if you're a student, you need to join our DreamSpark program. So if you join DreamSpark, you get all of our professional level developer tools for free. And it's free to join if you're a student. So, you, can do, you know, what's stopping you? Just join that and you, you can give you a real head start because you get a lot of benefits by being in DreamStart, DreamSpark. You get all our top developer tools. So you can build apps for Xbox Live, for X, uh, Xbox 360, for Kinect, Windows 8, Windows Phone, SQL Server, Windows, Azure, Windows Server. Uh, not mentioned on there is our cloud as well, Windows Azure. Loads of great help from our uh, developer community and, uh, and people like myself. Um, and you get free membership in the developer centers. So, I mean, on, on all these things, you can get started, wh whatever your level, whether you're a student or not, you can get started developing stuff for nothing. But if you then want to publish an app, you need to be a member of our, um, of our developer programs. And if you're not a student, until recently, that would have cost you $99 a year. That's actually, that's now come down to $19 a year right across the board. So it's a pretty, pretty modest sum anyway. But even, even you guys as students, it's zero cost to become a member of our developer communities. So, you know, $19, that's the uh, you know, price of a few beers. That's nothing to, be, uh, nothing to be upset about. So join the program, and then you can get access to all of these tools and start building and publishing apps for, at, at no charge. So go to dreamspark.com, and you can find out more details about that. Now, having joined the program, and maybe you would have installed our professional quality developer tools, Visual Studio 2012 or 2013, now Professional Edition, you then need to add in our phone SDK. So that's a free download. And even if you haven't got professional standard Visual Studio installed, you download the SDK, you get our Visual Studio 2012 Express Edition for Windows Phone. So this is, this is our tool set, get the SDK, and included in that is the emulator, the uh, project templates, the testing tools, everything you need to create great Windows Phone apps. Now then, even if you are not particularly, if you want to get started in an easy way, without necessarily using Visual Studio, just recently, we've released just about a month ago, a new web-based uh, tool for creating apps, which is aimed at anybody. So you don't need to have any programming skills to use this. So you need to have a concept of an app. And uh, it's called Windows Phone App Studio. It's in beta at the moment. Um, but this is a great tool for building out and getting an app up and running in next to no time. So it's um, available on the web. And uh, you have this portal to actually create, um, create your app. So I'm going to just run through a quick demo of that to show you what it looks like. <clears throat> so
So this is where it looks like. It's, it's at apps.windowsstore.com. Uh, you need, I've already signed in. You just need to sign in with a Microsoft account, so a Hotmail account, or you can create a free account. There's no charge for that. So you need to have your Microsoft account set up. And then you get to this page. You can choose to create an app using one of these prepackaged templates if one of these is close to the kind of app that you want to build. Um, loads of different ones you can choose from there, and it gives you a sort of a style that you can uh, use there. Uh, but I'm just going to create an empty app. Oh, okay, thank you. So I need to come out of that. Of the uh, oh, okay. All right, let's try that again. So. Uh, you now see, this is Windows Phone App Studio. I need to just sign in. <coughs> and right, this is what I was talking about there. So now you can see what I was, what I was looking at. <coughs> this is the main page. You can choose your template to create yourself an app. There's lots of different styles there. Birthday party, my hero, video channels, a family app, favorite band, and so on. Or your hobby and this kind of thing, or a sports team. So lots of different ones, and they have a prepackaged styling and things that might be close to the sort of thing you have in your head. Um, I'm just going to do the empty app one, and we can create. Uh, I'm going to create an app for one of my favourite websites. So you can you can actually, you know, you can include RSS feeds and YouTube channels very easily, and that sort of thing. You can create static pages. So uh, like I said, this is not really aimed at the professional developer, but for anybody who wants to uh, wants to get started. Although. Actually, if you're a beginner developer, it's a good idea to start with this because you get the source code. It will generate the source code. You can download it and use that as a great way of learning how an app works and how it's put together. Um, I'm going to create one from one of my favorite websites, which is a thing called UKC, which is uh, short for UK Climbing. Um, so actually, this evening, I'm going up. I'm going to jump on the train. I'm heading up to Scotland. I'm up there next week for a... A week of frustration trying to find some dry rock to climb on because the weather's just changing, as you've probably heard this weekend. So this is it. I could put a logo on. I'm not going to bother. Then we can go and configure the uh, app content. I'm going to add a new application section to this. Um, and I'm going I'm to choose a, an RSS feed from UKC. Um, I'm going to call this section um, uh, Latest uh, Picks because there's uh, some good photos on there. And I'm going to give this a name. You can see it's just a, and save the changes. So that's kind of done the configuration. And then I need to configure this UKPix thing. And there's an RSS feed URI there. Now I'm going to go off to UKC and I'm going to uh, go and find the, uh, the RSS feed that I want. Uh, there's loads of great stuff in here. There's the um, weekly top 10, for example. Um, and helpfully on UKC, they love their content to be consumed by anybody else who wants to with RSS browsers. So if I hit that XML, it's going to take me to the RSS feed version of that page. So I can steal that URI, go back to App Studio, and just plug that in there. And once that's cool, we can just save the changes. And up here, it's going to give me a preview. That's, that's kind of a default thing. We can change the layout on it as well. So lots of options. Oh, that wasn't the one I wanted. Go back. Uh, sorry, that's the one I wanted to do, the configuration. So we can do a different kind of styling. Maybe I'll do that one. And you can see on the right, you're getting, that's what my app is going to look like. And when I'm happy with that, you save the changes on that. And then, of course, you can add extra sections and additional pages. I'm going to leave it at that because otherwise it would get too boring. But you can get the principle of this. You can change the styling. Maybe I want my header to be uh, red. And maybe I want my background to be a uh, tasteful kind of uh, blue there. So, you know, you can, you can do all sorts of stuff. You can actually put an image as your background. So it's very easy to configure this. And when you're, when you're happy with that and you've built it out, you get to the summary. And then you say generate. And it will chunter, chunter away for a little bit. Um, it claims it will take a few minutes. Actually, this, this was launched about a month, six weeks ago, and it's been phenomenally successful. So they've been struggling a bit with the capacity. They back, they beefed up the back end. Um, so uh, that, will, that will keep on working for a few minutes. And up in the cloud, it's actually generating all the actual project code for this, that you, the, this thing that we've just defined. Um, and when it's done, 
it will, there you go, it emails you a certificate. So you have to install the certificate onto the phone you want to run it on. So it just comes as an email attachment. You just open it and tap on it, installs a digital certificate. Then scan that QR code, and that will install your app onto the phone so you can try it out. And then ultimately, later on, when you've tried it out and done a few iterations, you can then actually download it. At this point, you would need a developer account because then you would publish it, submit it to the store. So this is a really great way of getting, um, getting started. And as you see there, there's an option to download the source code. This is a Visual Studio project. So even for professional developers, this might be a really good way of getting started. And then you can go in and modify the source code and turn it into exactly what you want. Um, because obviously, any app generator, it has certain criteria. You know, it's very flexible, but sometimes your imagination extends beyond what it can offer. So that's a quick introduction to that. And let me pick up at the right point of the slides again. All right, so that was the App Studio. Now then, <coughs> that's not pure, that's kind of, that's, uh, that's a light way of building an app and it's a really great way of getting started. But now I want to talk about uh, the main way we create apps for Windows Phone which is XAML-based app development. XAML is XML application markup language. Everybody just calls it XAML. It's just our, uh, our way of defining the UI, the primary way. Uh, I'm just going to run through a few of the key features that we use when we're developing apps. First and foremost, of course, the tiles. This is the really thing that differentiates our platform from some of the others. We've got three styles of tile you can associate with your app. The flip template, as the name suggests, actually flips over. So you, you as a developer can write content onto the front and the back side of the tile. And it will animate nicely and flip over between the two. The one in the middle is called our, uh, is our uh, uh, iconic style, which is this very clean 2D flat style that um, is, reflects the Windows Phone style. And again, all this is programmable. And then the bottom one, the cycle tile, where you typically give it a list of, of uh, up to nine uh, either static photos or URIs to photos. And it will animate nicely between them. And all these can be pinned to the start screen by the user. And uh, you can also do st interesting stuff with the lock screen. So your app could be one of the ones that puts something down the bottom here. You can have up to five apps. Obviously, the user is completely selectable by the user, but your app could be one of the ones that puts summary information at the bottom. If you've got accounts, you want to communicate to the user on the lock screen. You could also be the one that puts the detailed information, the lock screen text, or the one that provides the background image. So another nice way, a lot of weather apps, for example, do this, and they do a custom image on the lock screen image. So the user, when they just open up their phone, the first thing they see is a snapshot of the weather for the next so 12 hours. So that's, um, that's another thing you can do. We've also got on uh, Windows Phone 8, uh, part of our tie-up with uh, Nokia, uh, from right from the first uh, moment when we actually made our, um, our, our agreement with them and they started using our, our, our platform exclusively, was they brought us their Navtech-based mapping technology. We've got superb mapping technologies based on the Navtech uh, backend. Uh, you can create really great uh, location-based and mapping-based apps with turn-by-turn -turn directions and also background location tracking. So um, we've got a whole new lo location API. We've got continuous, continuous background location tracking as well for things like run trackers. This is one of the real fun features on Windows Phone 8. We've got a really superb speech recognition and speech synthesis. So you could write your own uh, Siri-like application if you wanted to. Um, it uh, supports a lot of languages. Um, it's actually very easy to, uh, to program. Two different ways of using it. Voice commands. So you can actually speak to your phone and say, uh, my Andy Sport app, show me latest scores. And it will go straight to, it will open, launch the app, go straight to the page. And then, well, you could show the user that information. Or in fact, better still, have your app talk it back to them. So this is great for like in-car apps or even anybody who wants to have an interesting way of interacting with your application. Uh, we've got a whole bunch of controls, a huge control set, both our own and from uh, third-party vendors. So, I mean, this is just a, a snapshot of some, one of the things we've got. We've got very rich listing controls. Now, of course, smartphones being what they are, we need to have very clever ways of presenting long lists of information with a small screen. 
So this is an example of our long list selector where we have this uh, jump list style built into it. So if you want to you want to go to a particular part of the list, you can tap on the in the middle there, tap on the D square and it will go to the screen on the right. It gives an easy way to navigate through the collection. And we've got list headers and uh, headers and footers. It's a very rich control. That's just one of the ones that we've got. And of course a great web browser control. I'm going to talk a little bit more about that when I come to talk about HTML5. Windows Phone 8 at the moment, we've got three screen resolutions. Uh, WVGA was the only one we had on Windows Phone 7. Uh, but uh, with Windows Phone 8, we've got WXJ and 720p. Um, it has have been, there's been a lot of speculation on the internet from various sources that uh, we might have a 1080p full HD device coming. I couldn't possibly comment, but uh, that's, uh, that's um, uh, obviously the next, next thing that would be good to add to this. So we've got three great screen resolutions available at the moment. I mean, today on the screen res, is, yeah, uh, one good thing about, about being a developer is you don't have to create three separate UIs for them because uh, we've got uh, hardware accelerated graphics and we work to a, a logical screen size of 800 by 480. Changes slightly on the 720p. And it's hardware scaled at runtime, so you don't have to worry about that. You just design always to that same size. Bluetooth and NFC. So uh, we had a, ha a hackathon and uh, one of the teams did this cute thing with NFC tag with, uh, for a restaurant so you could tap on an NFC tag and uh, put your orders in and uh, launch the, the, uh, a web page to, uh, to uh, put your order into the, to the till system. So you know you can do real nice interesting things with NFC. I was at the Mobile World Congress show in, uh, back in uh, March in Barcelona. It's a huge show. It's like 70, 80,000 people there. So you can imagine what the security is like in the morning. If you happen to turn up at half past nine, quarter to ten, which is when most people arrive, the queues are insane to get into the building. It's like they've got a lot of gates and a lot of security, but there's long, long queues and everybody has to have their badge checked, you know, and so it's, it's, it's pretty painful getting in. Unless, of course, you're a lucky person with a Windows phone or with an Android phone, because on the right they have these NFC gates. So as part of the registration, you could, you could download the NFC badge app and you uploaded a photo of yourself and when, at the conference registration, you were, you were verified. So they said, yeah, that is definitely you. And then when you came in in the morning, you waved cheerfully to the long queues of iPhone users all on the side there. And you come to the NFC badge gate and you just tap your phone on the, uh, on the reader, they wave you through. That's a really nice practical use of uh, NFC technology. And lots of other cool stuff. And what's really good is it works as well between devices. So you can do tap and share. Obviously, the thing tap and share pictures and contacts and that sort of thing. But you can also do it to launch a high bandwidth network connection between apps. So you can be playing multiplayer games between two devices or between a phone and a tablet. So really interesting things you can do with that. Um, of course, we have in-app purchase. Not much more to say about that. So that's, there's um, support for all of those kind of things. And I've only really scratched the surface in terms of what you can do with Windows Phone. So, um, there, but there's whole loads of other things, background processing, um, file association, scheduled tasks, so you can have things that run in the background independent of the, of the main foreground app. Uh, so it's a very, very rich um, thing. Lenses, which is a way of integrating with the camera hardware. Lots of really exciting stuff happening. Obviously, Nokia Lumias are really blazing a path with their absolutely amazing cameras. And we've got a lot of great new camera apps coming out. So there's a, now a really good uh, pro app for doing, uh, for running the, using the camera on no, no, high-end Nokia devices, where you can really get all, access to all of the camera settings that you, you don't normally see in a, in a smartphone app. Okay, that's, um, that's kind of enough background. I'm going to actually now I'm going to do some live coding. Um, and you'll have to cross your fingers for me because <coughs> I'm using Visual Studio 2012, no, Visual Studio 2013 Preview Edition, which was launched um, um, a couple of months ago. Um, and it's a fine tool. Um, but it's a bit unstable, so it's a preview. It's not. It's, this is not a, a released product. So I found in practicing this, as long as I save often, uh, we might get through it. So uh, cross your fingers for me. What I'm going to do is build a, a, an app from scratch and try and make it a realistic kind of thing you would build. And it's, it's going to be a Twitter app. So we're going to go off to Twitter. We're going to pull down some tweets. I'm going to show them in a list on the screen. But it's a nice way of showing you all the different uh, kind of processes you go through in building an app for Windows Phone. 
Uh, this is Visual Studio 2013. I'm going to go file. New project. Um, and I'm going to call it Twitter Reader. OK, so um, on the right there, you can see Solution Explorer. This is like the directory of all the files that are in this solution. But the important bit here is this bit in the middle, where we've got the uh, image of the phone, which is your design surface, um, some status stuff at the bottom. And this here, this is XAML. This is that XML. So everything you're seeing on the left there is actually represented by this XML. Now, if you're a real hardcore programmer, you can just type raw XML into this. But most of us are kind of more pragmatic than that, and we're going to use the tools. So I'm going to start off by, uh, let's change the title. So convention is to have that in uppercase. So it's a Twitter reader. And um, I'm going to change the name as well. Uh, so let's change that to uh, latest. That'll do. And uh, here's the design surface. Now you'll see that the page is made up by a lot of, this is grid, it's kind of HTML-ish, if you like. So um, it's a flowy thing. So I've got a grid object here. I'm just set setting pro uh, content on it. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to have a uh, text box where you can enter a, uh, a Twitter handle into it. And then I'm going to put an application bar, which is I'm going to have a button on it. And when you press the button, we go off to Twitter and we pull down the latest tweets for that person. Um, so I'm going to need, I'm going to lay out this screen as a uh, grid, yeah, it's already a grid, I'm going to lay out some different rows in it. So I'm going to create myself a new row, so I can do that just by clicking there, and then go off to the toolbox. Here's all the tools, you won't be able to read that, but um, the one I want is a text box that allows the user to type into it. Drop that onto my design surface. Uh, I'm just going to make sure that's in the right place. So there we go, I'm focused on the bottom there. Uh, this document outline window, so I can rename stuff. So I'm going to rename that, col that control to a name text box. So now I can address it in code, I can get access to it. Um, and I'm going to change the, uh, the default text in it as well, just put my own Twitter handle in there. Uh, now then I'm going to change this row, it's, it's, it's sized it explicitly to 52 pixels, but I want it to be automatically sized so it's just big enough to hold the contents of what I've put in there. So I'm going to change that to a auto-sized row. There we go. Now it still hasn't collapsed it because this control here uh, has got a load of margins around it. So I'm going to change the, uh, remove all the margins around it. And now I've got this nice, I've got a row that's got a nice auto height just containing that text box. So that's where I can type my uh, Twitter handle into it. Next thing is, we want to give our user the way of interacting with this page. So I'm going to create myself what's called an application bar, which is where we tend to put the most used buttons and things. So I'm going to set focus on to the, uh, the top element here in the XML, which is the page for an application page. And here's the, uh, in the, see the properties window down here? I'm going to create myself a new application bar. And that now reveals some extra properties. I'm going to add some buttons to it. So I want to create one new button on my application bar. Um, I need to put a picture on it, an icon. So these are the ones that come out of the box. So you, you've got all the standard ones that you want to use. You can create custom ones as well, of course. So I'm going to put the refresh icon onto that. And you have to put a little text hint as well. Uh, refresh. And so there we go. And you can see now there's our nice button on the application bar. I want to put an event on that, a click event. So when the user interacts with it, taps on it, well, I can run some code. So I can do that by going again in, in the properties window. And I'm going to call the method refresh underscore click. So that's created my, me a method. And this is where I put my code to go off to Twitter. Now, before I fill that in, I've got a bit more plumbing preparation work I want to do. This, by the way, is the, uh, what we call the code behind or the code beside. Ah, uh, uh, this is why I said it's a bit unstable. Right, thanks for that. And I, thought, I forgot, I should have built and saved, should have built and saved at that point. Right, okay. So, um...
Right, let me go back to the one I was in the middle of doing. How far did it, how, what did it save? Uh, actually, nothing at all. Nothing at all. That's really helpful. Okay, so what I'm going to do is uh, plan B here is um, I'm going to just, uh, I'm going to go to one that was finished before. I'm going to walk through what I would have done to build to show you. So, um, like I said, this, that, this, uh, this is not, this is um, under development. It's a, it's a pretty unstable, um, it's a pretty unstable um, build of Visual Studio. So, uh, there's going to be new ones coming out. The final one won't be released until later this year. So where was I? I was about to fill in, refresh, click, and as you can see, I have done on there, but, all right. So what I would have done then, I would have, I would have added in some classes to store my data, which is uh, we, we store data in these things called view models. So it's very much like a model view controller architecture, for those of you who are familiar with that, where you have your view is the XAML, which is just the bit the user looks at. The model bit of it is your data, which in this case is Twitter. And the, uh, the controller bit, if you like, um, is, uh, is, is a combination of the logic here in the page and our view model. So view model takes the data that's exposed by the model and, and exposes it to a view. So uh, in order to support my application, I, created, I would have created two classes. One, a Twitter post. So this is an object. When we get the, tw the data from Twitter, it's going to come as XML. And I need to parse that XML and extract the important data from it. So for each tweet, I, I'm interested in three bits of information. The, the date it was posted, the text of the tweet, and the image of the person who tweeted or posted it. So that's what's represented by this. And I also need a class that represents a collection of those objects. So that's what this is. It's a, re it's a thing called tweets collection, and it's a collection of Twitter post objects. Now, in order to... Uh, to uh, hook that up. I then hooked the tweets view model up to my main page. And then I would have shown you, bear with me, our other tool, which is the one that's really good. Visual Studio is a good tool, but it's more focused at developers. So at coders. So coders home is Visual Studio. You can do some design in Visual Studio. It's quite good at that. But what's really good at doing design is this thing called Blend, which is more aimed at designers. So uh, two tools, they're both working on exactly the same files, Expression Blend and Visual Studio. This is Blend. Now, one, one thing that's really important, which actually isn't in this, is we can, you can create some design time data, which helps you to view what's going on. So I'm going to design, create some design time data. So while your designer is laying things out, they want to look at some realistic data. So I'm going to create some design time data from that view model class. So it will go away and it's, it's automatically creating um, a, a collection of objects. So um, let's just get the, uh, get, make sure I don't break this thing, that would be really bad. So I could drag that on and bind, bind that to that. And you can see how it's filled in the, uh, the layout there with, uh, uh, with, with some data. So um, you can then, this is a, it looks like a, a, a you know, a big mess. So I can actually want to then go and change the layout a little bit. So I can edit the template that's being used to pre present that data. And we can start making things look a little bit tidier. So I can go off into properties. And let's put a bottom margin on that so that we've got some nice spacing. So there's 12. That's looking a bit better already. Um, let's change the uh, highlighting on that. So we can go in and we can edit the style that's being used. I can apply one of the built-in styles. Let's put the accent style. So now we've got a nice style on that. We can also make it the design time experience a bit more realistic by changing the data. So by default, um, the tools use this thing called lorem ipsum est. Has anybody heard of that? Lorem ipsum est. It's, it's heavily used in digital publishing. It actually was used way back in like the, uh, the uh, 16th century. So when they were creating the first printing presses, big old mechanical things, you know, they needed to have a, some way of setting them up so the printing would be aligned. And they had a standard text that they would use for doing that, which was this Latin called lorem ipsum est, blah de blah de blah And that was used like way back, 1500 and something. And it's still used today in the digital publishing thing. And that's what this is, lorem ipsum est. 
So, but anyway, that's not appropriate for everything. So you can go and change that to a uh, to a uh, uh, to a date, and we can go and change the number of words, for example, and change that to 24 words. And immediately you can see that uh, things are getting a little bit better, but we can change the properties on that to make sure that the text wraps. So let's go and change the uh, uh, the wrapping quality on that text wrapping. We'll change that to uh, to uh, wrap. And you know you can see you're getting a feel for the design process here, working with realistic but design time data. And when we're done with all of that, oh, I just want to change the. Uh, oh, I'm going to actually then. Um, not going to save any of those changes because I don't want to break anything. And those changes will come back into here. I'm just going to make sure that uh, we have got the right layout in here. And my app is kind of all ready to go now. The logic, just so you know, I've also used a third-party uh, library, which is on. We've got a thing called NuGet. So NuGet is this uh, uh, online repository of lots of third-party packages. So anybody can create a NuGet package and can post it up onto NuGet, and they get rated. And you can see all the ones, very uh, obvious, obvious ones like jQuery, JSON.NET, all sorts of things. But the one I would I would use is one that should be already installed into this, which is a thing called Link to Twitter. It's a way of doing queries against Twitter, easily easy queries against Twitter. So that one's already installed into my solution. And then my logic in here, this is where this code comes in. Uh, this is all the code to this thing, where we're making a call. Uh, this makes this, the call off to Twitter. And then when we get a response back, we first of all check for an error. And if there's an error, we'll put a message up and quit out. But if there's no error, this is where we parse that XML from Twitter. We change it and translate it, if you like, into a list of Twitter post objects. And then we load that into our view model. So this is how we get our data and load it into our view model. And now we should be in good shape to run this thing. So I'm going to run this on the emulator. This is the emulator. It's um, a virtual machine, like I said. And my name is in there, so I'm going to now go and hit the uh, refresh button. And there we can see the tweet, latest tweets that I have, um, I have uh, posted on there. So uh, we've got a few ones on there. Um, a few on Campus Party, of course. And you see, this is the list control. Where it's got all, that already got all this nice, bouncy stuff that you'd expect from a good control. That's all built into the control. So that's a very simple little application that, if it hadn't crashed, I would have built in like 10, 15 minutes. Um, I've got one more interesting feature I want to show, actually, on this application. In this, you'll notice an extra little button on the application bar there. Now, before I hit that button, I want to show you the code. There's a, a button on there. That's the code that I've added to my app just for behind that button. So the little icon, in case you didn't recognize it, um, is a, a beer bottle. So this is going off, it's calling something called a maps task. This is an example of actually going out and executing something on the platform. So um, back to my emulator, you see this is my beer thing. So I'm pressing that now, it's going to launch the maps task. And it's, it's given me, and it's done a search, and it's returned me all the pubs that are near to my current location. So I'm going to choose this one, which is the Royal George in Greenwich. Um, and you can see that, so there we go. Um, that's the, uh, to the Royal George, so we were focused on that. And we can get directions to it, to the Royal George, and it goes from my current location at the O2, and it's now giving me directions. So this is all, just by those three lines of code, I've added all this rich functionality into my application. So this is calling out to the stuff that's built into the platform. So, you know, how cool is that? You've got all that great stuff, and it's seamlessly linked to the app. Now I'm back in the app. I just went back, back, back into the app. Three lines of code for that, so that's pretty cool. Right. All right, so that was a quick introduction to XAML-based application development. What about games? So we've got a great platform for games dev. Um, you can do coding with obviously using our partners' platforms, uh, but at, at right down the native level, you can do native games development based on DirectX. 
If you create a game for phone or for Windows 8, you can translate that with minimal changes and run on both platforms. At the moment, this is the best story for compatibility between the two. Our XAML stories are close, but you do have to be a little bit agile. You have to, be, you have, to have a little bit of good organization to make the most of that, but this is really very close. Um, so this is one way of writing games, and a lot of great games are getting created. But in order to uh, really, and a lot of very popular games frameworks are available for Windows Phone. Most well known, of course, things like Unity. You've got really great support from Unity. There's a big competition at the moment with Unity around Windows Phone. Um, and uh, Havoc and Autodesk, Autokinetic and FMOD. And there's a great, great sample that you can look at, which I won't show you now, which is this thing called the Marble Maze, which you can download from our website. This is a game where the same source code is used on Windows 8 and on Windows Phone 8. So you could take a look at that to have a look at how you create games for that. Right, I'm just going to close with a quick mention about uh, our HTML5 support. So uh, HTML5, of course, very popular for creating uh, cross-platform games, uh, applications and games. Now, if you saw my colleague Martin Beebe's presentation this morning, he was talking about how on big windows, Windows 8, uh, WinJS and HTML5 are actually first-class native development uh, tools for creating our, uh, you know, fully, fully native apps. Not quite the same on the phone. So actually we have a model on, on Windows Phone that's closer to what the kind of stuff you probably do on Android and iOS. So we can have a, uh, a web browser control with HTML5 content rendered within it, which can be hosted in a, a, a very slim native uh, shell. So kind of a web view model. You, we've got a template, you can create a uh, uh, an HTML5 based app uh, and that creates you a, a ready to go template. <coughs> um, it's based around Internet Explorer 10 which is hardware accelerated, really great performance. Um, it's very, very fast. It actually has JIT compiled JavaScript in there as well. So it's a really sophisticated app, uh, platform for running your HTML5 based apps um, and offline, offline apps of course is possible well, is with it as well. Hardware acceleration uh, extends to all of the highlighted features you can see there, which will mean more to HTML5 devs than to, to uh, some of the others of you here. But what you get, what this adds up to is superb performance. Um, and uh, we've also got great CSS3 support as well, um, such as 2D and 3D transforms, um, don uh, animations, of course, and, uh, and, and great support for uh, uh, shadows and the transitions and the like. Uh, so it's a, it's a really, really great, rich support we've got for HTML5 on our platform. Um, easy to catch a touch as well. We've got the gesture events um, built on top of the MS Pointer model. Uh, multiple touch points. And gives access to, uh, to the touch language. So you can have multiple multi-touch support on there and recognizes pan and pinch with inertia support as well. Now, of course... In a perfect world, all you would need is HTML5. But HTML5, of course, on all platforms, is a, is a developing standard and uh, doesn't actually cover all the needs you might have as an application developer. So uh, this is where you want to call out as well and, and maybe combine a bit of native code with your HTML5 application. And uh, the good news is we can do that. So you can call out from JavaScript and invoke a C-sharp or VB function. And you can do the reverse as well. So you can have some native code, C-sharp there, and invoke a JavaScript function running in your HTML5 page. So uh, you can do things like uh, save data, persistent data in, as in files on, on the phone. Uh, so here we've got an example of getting the inquiry string and, and the JavaScript is calling out and sending that to our C-sharp host application. And the C-sharp then is, uh, can actually call back in. In this case, it's uh, opening a, uh, an HTML file that's stored locally with a stream reader and it's, in, it's sending that string to the JavaScript and invoking it. So you can dynamically invoke JavaScript as well. So it's very rich and very flexible. Um, and all the kind of uh, other stuff you might expect to do. So good navigation support, um, loading files directly from uh, the Zap. Zap is our uh, package where you, you use for shipping content around, um, setting background color and that sort of thing. And in, addition, in addition to uh, that support, we've got uh, PhoneGap support as well, uh, which is a nice framework for creating apps that run cross-platform, which is another HTML5-based solution. 
Right, my final demo, I'm just going to show you for the HTML5 uh, the, uh, uh, a demo called Yeti Bowl, which is, um, um, I've got an application here, Yeti Bowl. Uh, let me go and find the, uh, the source. Um, so here, I'm going to run this in a browser. Uh, let's open it with uh, Firefox. So this is a regular HTML5. It's a it's a game. So you can see the uh, the creatures come down, and the Yeti has to throw and try try to hit the hit the uh, aliens or whatever they are. They like an animated TV sets or something. I don't know what they are. Um, but you can see that this uh, this simple but compelling game. You chuck the rocks down, and and these guys go up. And this is pure HTML5. So that's running in uh, uh, in Firefox. Now I can go on to uh, Visual Studio. Um, and do file, new project, and I'm going to create myself a Windows Phone HTML5 app. And let's call this, let's call it, unsurprisingly, Yeti Bowl. Uh, Yeti Bowl 1, there we go. Um, and you get a default HTML5 application. I'm going to just going to tidy it up a bit because there's some stuff in here that I'm going to replace with the uh, the one we just looked at. So we're going to delete that, uh, delete that, and we're now going to go to um, XAML.cs. I'm going to just do a bit of tidying up here. I uh, don't need that, um, and don't need uh, this. Um, and I think it's one other thing I need to just get rid of this, which again is is kind of the prepackaged thing. Uh, go to the main page. Um, I, this is my. Uh, I'm going to actually go and drag and drop all of this content, um, all of that stuff up there. I'm going to click and drop it and drop it into my project. Just going to include it all of that exact same HTML into there. I want to make a couple of changes to this to the web browser. I'm going to say is uh, um, is script enabled so it can run scripts is equal to true. Um, and I'm going to say uh, source source is equal to um, HTML slash a game .html. And if the gods are with me, we'll run that on the emulator, and that should be sufficient just to port that HTML5 app over to. There we go. And it's running, and uh, here come my uh, anime, my little little TV sets. So uh, you can play it just the same. Uh, drop the boulders and. Uh, you can see how easy that was and how good the support is across there. All right, so um, just to wrap up then, so that was that. <coughs> so for you, if you want, more want to learn a bit more about developing for Windows Phone, uh, there's a whole bunch of resources there, you can see, which um, I'll put on my blog, andywigley.com. I'll put this slide deck up, so if you want to get, the, obviously you won't be able to read all this now. Loads and loads of great resources for uh, creating your first app, porting apps, design, development, um, testing and publishing. So really great resources there. Um, back to DreamSpark, if you're a student, jo join DreamSpark, it won't cost you anything, you can get all of these resources. And please follow us um, on uh, the developer blog at the Dev Center, on Twitter, and on Facebook. All right, um, that, is, uh, that is all I have for you. Got time for questions or we're done? Yeah. Anybody got any questions for me? Everybody happy? All right, in that case, thank you very much for listening. I hope you found that informative. Thanks.